Okay. There we go. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this webinar today. Great to see such a good turnout. Uh, we actually had quite a few registrations, so I can see people coming through, and, and my colleague here today, Jazz, will be uh, running the show and letting people in. Uh, we're very happy to be speaking on this important topic today. Firstly, uh, I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kai, and I'm the CEO of Verify Now, which is an employment screening company. Our mission is to help organisations build a trusted workforce. With me today is Jazz, Jazz Andrews, who's running the webinar and will be fielding your questions throughout the chat. Um, to help our experts from Source Legal and HR answer them later on. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today, both past and present. The Darug and Eora people have been custodians of the land around this Canterbury Bankstown area in New South Wales for thousands of years. I would also like to acknowledge that today is March 8th, which is International Women's Day, and the UN uh, Women's theme for 2023 is Cracking the Code, innovation for a gender equal future. This theme highlights the need to embrace new technologies, ideas and education to combat discrimination and marginalization of women worldwide. We know that innovation drives change and by championing women's unique skills and knowledge in STEM, we can speed up progress towards gender equality. While some of us may not be from STEM based companies here today, uh, the message of supporting innovation through gender inclusion and empowerment of women is relevant in all workplaces. With this mission in mind, it's fitting that today's webinar focuses on the Respect at Work reforms, which were introduced late last year, which further strengthens legal protections against sexual harassment in the workplace. These reforms are intended to create a safer environment for everyone, including women, to contribute feel fully to innovation at work. We're grateful to have our friends from Source Legal and HR here today to share their insights and expertise on this topic. Source, legal and HR make it easier than ever to access legal and HR services and work hard to ensure that their clients' workforces are supported, optimised and fair work compliant. Thank you so much for your generous time today and, uh, you know, to, to discuss some of the key details from the Respect at Work laws and how it may impact our organisations and what changes we need to make. Presenting today, I'd like to introduce Tina Melbourne, who is the Executive Director of Source HR and Legal, and Chanel McDonald, Legal Counsel for Employment and Safety. I'll shortly be handing it over to Tina and Chanel in a moment, but before we do so, I'd just like to go through a few housekeeping points. You should see on your screen a Q&A tab. Uh, this is the place to go, so just on the top, if you're not familiar with Teams, just on the top there is a Q&A tab. This is where you go to place questions throughout the presentation. Please continue to post your questions uh, whenever you think of them. I'll keep an eye on it, and I know Jazz will as well throughout the presentation. Uh, and I'll continue to remind those who post questions in the comment section. Actually, we don't have a comment section, but please include it in Q and A. We will answer it at the very end. Um, Tina and Chanel will get a you know a, quite a bit of time to answer some of these questions. If they are very specific to your organisation, I would encourage you to uh, have a conversation with the team from Source HR and Legal. Uh, I will also say that at the end of this. We'll send out copies of the slides to everyone who's registered today, because I know some of you will want to share this with your colleagues. So again, uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, I'll now turn it over to the presenters, Tina and Chanel. Thanks, Tina, over to you. Okay, good morning, everyone. So can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so thanks for the introduction, Kai. So as Kai mentioned, I'm Tina Melbourne, so Executive Director of Source HR, and really honoured to be um, invited to present on this really important topic with um, my colleague Chanel McDonald from our legal team. Uh, so today we're going to discuss the recent introduction of the Respect to Work legislation. So we'll cover what the legislative changes are, what they mean for your organisation, and the actions you should take, as well as the risks of non-compliance. It's a big shift and an extensive topic. So today is going to be quite high level. And as Kai mentioned, time for questions. And we're more than happy to be contacted after the webinar for more guidance. So Respect of Work was championed by an inquiry from the Human Rights Commission. This was following their 2018 survey that revealed that one in three people had faced sexual harassment at work in the past five years. 
Yet, as we know, most people who experience sexual harassment never report it due to the fear impact it might have on their reputation, their career prospects and their relationships. So throughout the inquiry, the Commission heard of the need to shift from the current reactive complaints-based approach to one which requires positive actions from employers and a focus on prevention. So this uh, came into immediate effect after the Royal Assent in December. So we really need to start doing all of this now. So I'm going to hand over now to Chanel, who's going to run through what the legislative changes are. Excellent. Thank you, Tina, and thank you all for joining today's webinar. As mentioned, I'm going to start today's webinar off by explaining the key legislative changes which have come from that Respect at Work Act. Uh, I apologise in advance if the legal part of today's session is not particularly exciting. It's just so important to know what the law is so that you can understand why it may be particularly necessary to make changes to your business's operations. So after the unexciting legal spiel, I would promise to pass it back to Tina so you can hear her practical advice on how to respond to these legislative changes. Okay. As you'll see on the screen, probably the first key reform and the most important reform from this Respect at Work Act is the introduction of a positive duty in the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act that requires employers to take reasonable and proportionate measures to eliminate unlawful sex discrimination. So the unlawful sex discrimination includes sexual harassment, which is unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, harassment on the ground of sex, which was introduced uh, back in 2021, and that's unwelcome conduct based on the sex of a person, but doesn't necessarily need to be sexual in nature. Uh, discrimination on the ground of a person's sex is also unlawful, so that's treating someone different based on the sex of that person. Uh, conduct that subjects a person to a hostile work environment on the ground of sex. This is a new concept, which I'll discuss a bit later on, but basically that's conduct that results in an offensive, intimidating and humiliating environment for people of one sex. And it doesn't have to be directed at a person, which is different from sexual harassment, for example, where it's targeted to a specific person. And finally, unlawful uh, Conduct is acts of victimisation that relate to complaints or allegations in relation to any of the conduct that I just mentioned. So I think I know what you're probably all thinking is that employers have always been required to eliminate sexual harassment in the workplace, and that's true. However, the Respect at Work report, which Tina just mentioned, observed that the legal framework before these changes were introduced didn't actually effectively prevent sexual harassment because it focused on addressing and responding to conduct that had already occurred. Whereas the introduction of this new positive duty is intended to shift the focus by requiring employers to proactively take reasonable and proportionate steps to prevent the unlawful conduct from occurring in the first place. The meaning of reasonable and proportionate measures is adaptable and it will vary depending on the size, nature and circumstances of your business, as well as the financial and non-financial resources and the practicality and costs associated with taking any steps. Um, some possible examples of steps you could do, which may be reasonable and proportionate measures uh, to eliminate unlawful sexual conduct in the workplace could be implementing sexual harassment policies and complaint procedures or collecting and monitoring data from your workforce, um, provide making sure there's appropriate support for workers and employees to make complaints uh, and delivering training and education around unlawful conduct on a regular basis. However, I won't go into too much detail about that because Tina will provide you with all of this information a bit later on. Basically, with this positive duty, as long as you can hand, of, hand on your heart, say that you have taken all reasonable steps to prevent your employees from engaging in this unlawful conduct, your liability will be limited. Um, 
Oh, and just one final point to note is that with this reform, the positive duty applies to all business owners in respect of a broad category of workers. So this isn't just in employees, it includes contractors, subcontractors, labour hire workers, apprentices, trainees, volunteers, as well as third parties, external third parties like clients and suppliers. So it's not limited to your employees. That's important to note. Uh, the second, I'll just check one thing. Sorry, Jazz, would you mind just flipping, flipping back to the previous slide? Excellent. Yeah, I'm just on this second point now, express prohibition on conduct that subjects a person to a hostile workplace environment on the ground of sex. So this is the next key reform. And basically this means that businesses will now be required to stamp out any workplace behaviour which has the which has the potential to result in an offensive, intimidating and humiliating environment for people of one sex. Um, the Respect at Work report found that sexual harassment is more likely to occur where a workplace environment is sexually charged or hostile, even if the specific conduct is not directed at a particular person. So it was noted that conduct such as displaying obscene or pornographic materials, general sexual banter or innuendo and offensive jokes can result in people of one sex feeling um, unwelcome or excluded by the general working environment. And the existence of these environments can increase the risk of people experiencing other forms of unlawful discrimination, such as sexual harassment, as I mentioned. While the courts have determined that the conduct that results in a hostile work environment may be captured through the existing provisions of the Sex Discrimination Act, this was not well understood or recognised by employers. So this amendment would provide clarity and certainty to the law and set clear boundaries on acceptable conduct in the workplace. The uh, Sex Discrimination Act introduced the definition of a hostile work environment and it includes a requirement that a reasonable person having regard to all the circumstances would have anticipated the possibility of the conduct resulting in the workplace environment being offensive, intimidating or humiliating to a person by reason of their sex or characteristics that generally appertain to people of that sex. Uh, it should be emphasised also that this conduct does not necessarily need to be directed at a specific person, as I said before, whereas other forms of unlawful harassment, such as sexual harassment, generally need to be directed to a specific person for it to be unlawful. So when courts are deciding whether a person has subjected another person to a hostile workplace environment on the ground of sex, they'll consider the seriousness of the conduct, whether the conduct was continuous or repetitive, uh, the role, influence or authority of the person engaging in the conduct. Thanks, Jazz. Next slide, please. Okay, the next reform is the expansion of the investigative and enforcement powers of the Australian Human Rights Commission. I'm just going to refer to the Australian Human Rights Commission as the commission from now on. Um, the Respect at Work report recommended that the positive duty, which I mentioned just before, be accompanied by an appropriate enforcement mechanism to help ensure that it's effective and employers are actually engaging with their legal obligations. An appropriate enforcement mechanism would also ease the burden on individuals by enabling the Commission to initiate action to address unlawful discrimination rather than making the individuals raise these complaints. So what does this mean? The Commission will now monitor and address employer compliance with that new positive duty. So under the new powers, the Commission can conduct inquiries into compliance with the positive duty if the Commission reasonably su suspects non-compliance. They can provide recommendations to an employer to prevent a repetition or continuation of a failure to comply with the positive duty. They can give a compliance notice specifying actions that an employer must take or refrain from taking to address their non-compliance positive duty. 
The Commission can also apply to the federal courts for enforcement of any compliance notice which they have issued. The Commission can enter into enforceable undertakings with employers and actions and compliance. And finally, they can enable a representative body, so a union, for example, to progress a complaint from conciliation to court on behalf of one or more affected persons. And that really leads to that general hostile work environment where there may be multiple people in the workplace who have been affected. So the new commission powers will come into effect in December this year. So that just gives employers 12 months to understand and begin to comply with the positive duty. Well, I suppose that's nine months from now, but yes, it was 12 months from when these laws were passed. The next reform is a lower lowered threshold for finding of harassment on the grounds of sex. So the definition of harassment on the ground of sex has been amended so that, that, so that there is no longer a requirement for the alleged wrongdoer to have engaged in unwelcome conduct of a seriously demeaning nature. All that's required now is that the unwelcome conduct was of a demeaning nature. So this lowers the threshold requirements for a finding of harassment on the ground of sex. Harassment on the ground of sex captures harassing conduct that is engaged in by reason of someone's sex, but is not necessarily sexual. So, for example, a comment that persons of one sex are stronger or weaker than another sex or have particular strengths or weaknesses. They're examples of harassment on the ground of sex. And that's a relatively new um, concept that was introduced in 2021. So we're just trying to understand better from the courts how that's applied. And finally, the last reform are uh, amendments to timeframes for making a complaint under anti-discrimination legislation. So complaints made under the anti-discrimination legislation, which so anti-discrimination legislation is your anti-discrimination act, your racial discrimination act, and your disability discrimination act. And also mindful that I'm talking about Commonwealth legislation, federal legislation here, and different states have different different discrimination legislation as well, but I'm just focusing on the federal legislation. So the, any complaints made under the Commonwealth anti-discrimination legislation may now only be terminated by the Commission if more than 24 months have passed since the alleged uh, unlawful conduct took place. So previously the Commission had the discretion to terminate complaints made more than six months after the alleged unlawful uh, conduct took place. This isn't a really new uh, concept. It's just bringing the anti-discrimination legislation in line with the changes that were already made to the Res uh, Sex Discrimination Act in 2001. So I guess to finish up on my section here today, what I want you to take away from today's session is that you're now required to do more. You must be proactive in managing unlawful sexual conduct in the workplace, and there's going to be so much less tolerance of employers who adapt a reactive approach to managing these risks. Uh, please leave today's session and think about your business's operations and consider the practical measures you can implement now to comply with your obligations, because you, you are required to um, comply with these laws now. They came into effect in December. so. You know, it's March now, it's really time to start um, putting these measures in place. On that note, Tina, I will hand it back to you to provide an insight on what those practical measures um, employers should take to comply with these new legislative changes are. Thanks, Tina. Thanks, Chanel. Uh, so, as Chanel mentioned, um, you know, what do these changes mean for your organisation and what do you need to do? Uh, so, the first recommendation, um, next slide, thanks, Jazz. Yeah, so the first recommendation is to be undertaking a risk assessment around the risk factors for sexual harassment. So, a risk assessment should cover your business's demographics, working environment, physical environment, workplace trends and behaviours. We've heard the stats and every workplace can be affected and it can be in different ways to what you might think. So to be more specific, some of the things to consider in your risk assessment will be, does your workplace have an imbalance of one gender? 
does one gender hold most of the management, recruitment and decision making processes? Do you have periods where there are only a few people on site after hours? Is there a large number of contract or transient workers? And are there any potentially offensive materials on display? So once the risks have been assessed, we then look at the actions to con and control measures to implement for prevention. Thanks, Jazz. Okay, so first um, control measure, and uh, Chanel briefly touched on these, is to review and update your policies and procedures. So in Australia, there's no legislative requirement for policies. However, there are a number that we recommend to the minimum to protect your business. And the ones related to this topic for review are the code of conduct. Now, this should set clear expectation about behaviours in the workplace. Now, this is during any workplace um, related activity, which includes social events. Uh, a bullying, harassment and anti-discrimination policy. Now, this should have an extensive section now on sexual harassment or even better still, a standalone policy for sexual harassment. So a policy dealing with um, sexual harassment should include, and this list is by all means not exhaustive, uh, a definition of what sexual harassment is, what it isn't, and examples of behaviours, a clear statement that sexual harassment will not be tolerated by anyone at any time, an explanation of everyone's role in intervention and action, the strategies and control measures your business is taking to prevent, what a worker should do if they experience or witness sexual harassment, and information on the consequences, which may include disciplinary action up to termination of employment. So alongside the policy, it's really important that employees now understand what to do if they face or witness sexual harassment. So having a published and clear reporting process is important. So this may be included within the policy or a standalone reporting process. So under respect at work, your reporting process um, should include how workers can report sexual harassment. And you need to be considering different avenues for reporting. For example, if the complaints against a manager or HR, where's that next level that you would go to? How a complaint can be addressed, including informal and formal options, and when independent third party uh, might be engaged to investigate safeguards to protect against victimisation and support services and referral information for all people involved. Now, it's recommended to have all your policies acknowledged by staff. If you've got an HRIS, you generally can have a digital stamp or acknowledgement, um, or if you don't, um, you know, good old paper signature um, or digital signature. Um, so these should be reviewed by management and acknowledged by employees regularly. Okay, so um, the next control measure um, is providing training. And there is different levels of training that we recommend. Um, with these reforms, the exec or board level really should be understanding their obligations across the business, as well as all people managers. You know, the leaders um, really more and more need to understand all the various obligations that they have. And then we have employee level. So currently many organisations are undertaking some form of bullying, harassment and anti-discrimination training. This is best practice. Um, so this would, would traditionally have a sexual um, section on sexual harassment. However, this really needs to be reviewed and expanded um, or a specific course on sexual harassment delivered. Now, the training will cover a lot of the areas that we discussed, um, you know, we detailed the policy should um, contain. We really need to be able to ensure that employees understand all the various forms of sexual harassment. These days, more so as well, it includes e-harassment, um, what to do if they're affected, how to report it, as well as ensuring that employees who witness events are encouraged and empowered to report. Now, I'm going to go into further details on um, bystanders um, a little bit later on. So consider the frequency of your training related to the work, um, to the risk assessment. Obviously, the higher risk your business has, um, the more frequently you should be repeating the training. Okay, now the next control measure is ensuring there is a robust complaints or grievance handling procedure. So you've done the risk assessment, you've got the policies in place, managers and employees are trained, which is a great start in having a positive preventative actions. However, you need to consider what's in place to ensure you appropriately manage complaints when they come in, no matter how small. 
all complaints should be taken seriously and acted upon in a timely and appropriate manner. So timely is really key. So leaders in HR really need to have an understanding of the mechanisms to manage a process when faced with complaints. If we're promoting, promoting zero tolerance, it's critical to have expertise at hand to enable such action as standing down employees when a serious offence occurs pending investigation. Okay, so next slide. Thanks, Jazz. Um, we're going to talk about promoting a positive workplace culture. So I've touched a few times throughout this discussion on the importance of enabling those who witness events to report it. I've put this with the culture discussion as I believe environmental factors are key to employees having the confidence to report such instances. So Respect at Work talks about bystanders. So a bystander is someone who observes sexual harassment firsthand or hears about it subsequently. So not surprisingly, only a small proportion of bystanders currently take, take action and organisations are expected to create a culture where this shifts. An important strategy for eliminating sexual harassment is to encourage bystanders to take action. So being an active bystander can involve simple actions like changing the subject, asking a target if they're okay, you know, mentioning that comment or joke or tone is a bit much, and most importantly, bringing the inappropriate behaviour to the attention of managers, um, and this would be through the reporting process we spoke about. So workplace culture relies on all employees, not just looking out for themselves, but looking out for everyone else too. Now, clearly leaders play a very important role in creating a culture and developing a culture of respect can empower individuals to raise concerns in a supportive and protective way. So culture can't be shifted overnight. It takes continual and deliberate action and honest, respectful and open communication. This is one of the fundamentals to eliminating sexual harassment. So cultural items might include your company values if you have them and how you embed promoting your values and therefore behaviours through the employee life cycle. Leaders should be leading by example. We need to be seeing communication, acknowledgement and action as zero tolerance is key to shifting the culture. Okay, so there's some practical actions for you. Um, so I'm just going to hand back to Chanel to um, run over the risk of non-compliance. Thanks, Tina. Uh, just next slide. Great. Thank you, Jazz. On to it. So why is this all important? Because there's consequences for non-compliance with these changes. So I'm just going to list out there on the screen, but I'll just explain a few of these. Uh, businesses that breach the legislation may be subject to penalties for breaching the Sex Discrimination Act. So breaches of the Sex Discrimin Act, Discrimination Act don't have an upper limit of damages, and the court may consider various heads of damages, including for, humili for humiliation and hurt. Uh, compliance notices and enforceable undertakings can also be issued for breaches um, with employers in breach able to be publicly named. Um, there's also penalties under the Work Health and Safety Act. So what I said before is these um, requirements aren't new. That's correct because under the Work Health and Safety Act, you have that obligation to eliminate and minimise risks as far as possible, and that includes sexual harassment um, risks or unlawful sexual conduct. As well, there's been an introduction in the work health and safety legislation of uh, the obligation for business owners to eliminate psychosocial hazards as far as reasonably practicable. So failure to do so will contravene these obligations and result in penalties, and the penalties vary state to state. There's penalties for workers and for business owners as well, um, larger penalties for business owners, naturally. Uh, businesses can also suffer job loss and rep reputation damage. A failure to comply with these laws could result in negative publicity and damage uh, your business's reputation. A workplace culture that does not prevent harassment and discrimination is likely to be less attractive to potential employees, which may lead to a loss of talent and difficulty in finding and retaining those high quality employees. So that's from the commercial side. And also another consequence 
may be employee complaints and legal action. So employees who experience sexual harassment or discrimination may file complaints with the Australian Human Rights Commission and the Fair Work Commission, which may lead to investigation and potential legal action and the consequences which may flow from that in from the Fair Work Commission um, could be stop sexual harassment orders, for example, and monetary settlements or penalties. There's also increased insurance costs. So non-compliance with the laws may result in higher insurance costs for employers if employees make workers' compensation claims due to uh, suffering an illness or injury because of uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. And finally, a loss of productivity. So harassment and discrimination can create a hostile work environment. And it goes without saying that this will lead to employee dissatisfaction and potential loss of productivity. So I see that it's 10 o'clock and we've got some time for questions. So that concludes the content, content part of today's session. And Jazz, I'll hand it back to you to moderate any questions that have come through for us. Great, thanks Chanel. Um, I'll leave you on screen and I'm going to bring Tina on as well so I can ask you both um, some questions. Uh, look, thanks so much guys. That was really uh, a useful presentation. It was jam-packed with info and I'm sure everyone got a lot from it. Um, it this is a really important uh, thing for every business to be you know, on top of understanding. It's really relevant um, for us at Verify Now. If you'll indulge just a very brief little spruik for our company, we're an employment screening company and our whole purpose is to help create a trusted workforce for organizations. Um, but it's just as important, obviously, to create safety at work as well. And I feel like these reforms are really um, such an important step in that direction. So just on a side note, if anyone does want to talk about um, employment screening, feel free to get in touch. We will we'll be sending out the slides, as Kai mentioned, a bit later in the week, and I'll have um, contact details there for us. And of course, for Source HR and Legal, um, where you'll be able to ask them any questions you have, any follow-up questions about the changes um, brought about by Respect at Work, uh, or any other HR or legal related sort of issues that they might be able to help with. Um, now we don't have questions yet. Maybe Everett, maybe you did such a great presentation that everyone <laughs> has had all their questions answered. I do have a few here that I thought of, not to hog the limelight. Uh, <laughs> so I thought I'll, I'll ask you those, but I just want to remind everyone in case you haven't um, used uh, Teams webinar function before, on that top bar there, if you look at the top of your Teams screen, it'll say chat people, etc. There should be an option up there which says uh, Q&A, uh, which you can click on. And if you click in there, uh, there is the option there. You can click start a discussion and uh, you can write your question in there. So no pressure if you don't have any, but if anyone is thinking about, uh, you know, particular cases, how this might apply to their workplace, as I'm asking these questions, please feel free to, to put it in there and I will ask the experts. All right, so I'll let you guys decide who's best to answer this, but um, first of all, you know, as business owners or the people here today, HR professionals, you they have an idea now, but what's the best way to communicate this to the actual employees that will need to be aware of it? Yeah, I can take this one, Jazz. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, so it will, that's really going to, I guess, um, depend on the normal communication channels within your business and what's appropriate. So if it's a factory floor, um, there may be communication through toolbox talks if, if not everyone has um, digital access. Um, so, you know, the key thing is really creating that awareness. And as we said, which it should start at that leadership level um, and, um, you know, and then how change of policy and training is communicated throughout the business would be through the normal channels. But we just really need to ensure that the message is not just being sent out and it's obviously being received, it's being acknowledged. Um, you know, training, um, I always recommend some type of interactive training, not just um, uh, a webinar or not, not a webinar, just not just a video presentation where there's um, no interaction. So a digital course where there's a Q&A or in person where you know people are receiving that information. So, um, so yes, yeah, so through normal channels. Okay, yeah, great. I, I completely agree. Sorry, Jess. No, please. <laughs> I, I completely agree with that, Tina. And I just think now is the perfect opportunity for businesses to review their policies that they have in place and conduct that. That's the perfect time 
to be communicating this these changes to your employees. And also it just reinforces, I would be recommending reinforcing to your workforce uh, if you did want to implement a zero tolerance policy for this kind of conduct in the workplace, uh, it just promotes a better culture and really try to hone in on those messages of encouraging bystanders or even victims to speak up and that they're going to be supported. Let them know of the support uh, that's available to them if they were to make these complaints. Make sure that when you're doing this training, you're also reviewing your um, grievance handling procedure, reviewing your grievance handling procedures as well, um, and making sure they're robust enough so that employees know exactly what to do, not just employees, your managers. How are they going to be responding if they receive a complaint? So it's just a matter of having the discussions, doing the training, bringing awareness to your workforce. Um, and when before when I said zero tolerance policy. You've also, from a legal perspective, just got to be careful with this. It doesn't mean an employee with an unblemished record who's worked there for 20 years and has slipped up and done something wrong. It doesn't mean you lead straight to termination in that instance. It's going to be a case by case, um, you know, scenario where you determine what the appropriate disciplinary action is but by just reinforcing that message to your workforce that you know you don't tolerate this kind of behavior in the workplace it will make employees feel a lot more supported if they do want to raise a complaint thanks and continual <laughs> messaging and continual messaging it's not you do it and then you forget about it you know is there um do you have an employee newsletter it's 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 like well-being you know it's not a once off do something and then let it go it should be a constant conversation you know within within the business and awesome. someone popped during induction as well i saw mm. a comment pop put up and absolutely i mean that's when policies and training should begin but mm. um the frequency it, it Often to date has been maybe biannually for a lot of businesses for policies, reviews and um, and training. This is probably really more a shift towards annually, but it does de depend on the risk factors in the business, but um, more frequent and implementing training if you don't already have that because not all businesses do. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I sure. think with those policies, when you're reviewing them, a key factor to review is the application clause at the beginning of your policy and really clearly identifying who these, this policy applies to because it's not just your employees. As I said before, it's your volunteers, it's your work experience students. So that communication that they know themselves that they have to comply with this policy, doesn't matter where you sit within the organisation, is really critical. Mm. And not all organisations would do a very thorough contractor induction. So um, that's that's um, something that's really key, particularly those transient workers um, coming through. For sure. I, I have another question here um, from a participant. You mentioned changes to insurance. Do you think the workers' compensation insurers will possibly ask for what a business is doing in this space? Look, I'm going to, I'll take this one, Tina. <laughs> and I'm going to say, it's a great question and it's really not, I'm not an insurance lawyer, I'm an employment lawyer, so it's a bit difficult for me to answer that one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's so much pressure now on businesses to demonstrate what steps they're taking that potentially insurers may be requesting this information, but I'm just not too sure. It's a good question. I will actually... Um, circulate that question to our insurance team um, after this call to find an answer and maybe I'll let you know Jazz. Yeah I can, can include it in the mail. Circulate mailer. that yeah sure. thank you. Sorry I know that's not too helpful at the moment but I'll look into that. No thanks for looking into it that's that's great. Um, so another question is oh wait up, we've just got another one here from a participant. Um, have there been any best practice policies slash communication products developed by the legislators? So are there sort of, I think what that question is asking is the actual, you know, resources from the legislators of the respect to work reforms, have they put out best practices for how to, you know, any products or ways of communicating that? There are a lot of tools. So there, uh, I think it's respectatwork.gov.au, but the, there are um, fact sheets and tools 
There is a sample policy, um, but I know there's a there's a section that's been created around mining specific. So, mm -hmm. um, but I I found the um, the website very practical, very easy to read, and very simple. So I definitely suggest that um, that everyone reviews that. Um, it's very helpful in preparing this presentation. Um, so we can pop the link to that um, in the circulation as well. Okay, great. We'll do that. Um, and how do you know if a company is wanting to review their sort of policies and their procedures, what's a good way for them to figure out if they are up to date? Like how do you sort of audit your your policies in the best way? It's a great question. And as a lawyer, I would probably say come see a lawyer if you want, but obviously I know that's not, um, you know, viable for most people. I guess in addition to what Tina just said with that Respect at Work website, that would be my first port of call. Go onto that website, see what resources are available. If there's some template policies, I'd be comparing that policy against yours and seeing where you're, you're missing areas. There's also a um, on the Safe Work Australia website, a guide on the prevention of uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. And that there's a section in that guide which sets out what your sexual harassment policy should include. So I'd encourage you to have a look at those resources that are available and just see, do a gap analysis of where your policy currently sits compared to what's out there. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, come see us because we're, we're up to date with it. We've got um, update policies that we constantly refer to. So we're happy to review any policies. Okay, awesome. Well, it looks like we might be able to finish um, on time. You've obviously answered everyone's questions that they had. <laughs> um, so look, thanks so much for, for doing this today, guys. It was excellent. Um, I'll finish this up now. And like I say, we'll be sending out to everyone who attended uh, a recap of today and the slides. And if there are any other follow-up questions that people have, um, yeah, you know, please get in touch and, and let us know. Just had a participant there to say thank you um, and that that was great, which I'm sure, yeah, is the case for everyone. So thanks so much, guys, and thanks to everyone for attending. Um, have a great day. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.